Welcome to the 16th Madanlal Mehta lecture. So the Madanlal Mehta lectures, as uh, many of you have heard me say before, um, were uh, have is the Madanlal Mehta lectureship is an endowed lecture that is delivered that is usually de delivered annually um, by a distinguished visitor to the Department of Theoretical Physics. Uh, this lecture series was made possible by an endowment, a generous endowment given to us by uh, Mrs. Rani Mehta in memory of her late husband, uh, Professor Madanlal Mehta. So, uh, Madanlal Mehta was born on the 24th of December 1932 in a village in Rajasthan near Udaipur. He did his uh, master's in mathematics in 1956 in the University of Rajasthan. Then he came to TIFR for two years. Um, after which he went for uh, went to France to, uh, to do his PhD at Saclay. This was quite common in the early days of the IFR. Um, Baba and other senior professors would encourage promising student uh, students to go abroad and you know make contact with them with very with excellent people. Um, he did his PhD with Professor Block. The PhD was completed in 1961. He then spent the years 62 to 63 at IAS. Then he returned to India in 1963 and uh, spent three years at Delhi University. Um, in 1966, he went back to Princeton and a couple of other pla places in the US for a year. Then in 1967, he uh, moved to France to Saclay uh, for a permanent position and then stayed there till the end of his career. In 2005, he came back to India in January of 2005 uh, after retiring and uh, passed away on the 10th of December in 2006. Um, Madan Lal Mehta was, of course, a very distinguished uh, mathematical physicist with all sorts of results to his, his credit. I think many of, I think some of you certainly, uh, I first encountered Madan Lal Mehta when we were, when we read his book, this wonderful little book on random matrices that, that he's, that he wrote. Uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And if you've not looked at it, I strongly urge you to do so. Okay. So the Madan Lal Mehta lecture series was initiated in 2010 and has been held uh, uh, annually since then. Last, last year, we had three lectures to mark the 75th anniversary of the IFR. Okay, the uh, There have been several Madan Lal Mehta lecturers, and I'll read out the names of the last eight of them. They were Professor Ashwin Vishwanath from Harvard, in, uh, Professor Ashok Sen uh, from, uh, from now ICTS, uh, Professor Wendy Friedman, Professor Edward Witten, Professor Bert Halperin, Professor Saras Dumopoulos, and Professor Deepak Dhar. And uh, uh, our 16th Madan Lal Mehta lecturer will be Professor Joe Silk, whom we're very happy to have uh, deliver this lecture. OK, so I'd like to invite uh, our director to present uh, Professor Silk with a memento to start off with. Okay, uh, Shadab, would you introduce the speaker? Thank you, Ash, for that wonderful introduction to uh, this lecture series. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor J. Joseph today for this year's Madan Lal Mehta lecture. He is currently a professor of physics at Institute of Astrophysics Paris. He is also a homeward professor of physics and astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Previously, he was civilian chair of astronomy at University of Oxford, as well as chair of uh, uh, physics and astronomy at University of Berkeley. Professor Silk did his uh, mathematical typos from University of Cambridge and PhD in astronomy at University of Howard in 1968. So following his PhD, he uh, started his first position at Berkeley in 1970, uh, Professor Silk has worked on many areas of cosmology and astroparticle physics, uh, sorry, astrophysics, especially physics of cosmic microwave background, uh, galaxy formation, role of bionic processes in structure formation, nature of dark matter, physics of black holes, the fundamental process of self damping, 
which in cosmic macro uh, background anisotropy, which bears his name, it's uh, it's one of the remarkable uh, understanding of theoretical physics. The process of self damping has tremendous implication for our universe, uh, and the existence of this effect actually affects dramatically in terms of what we see in our neighborhood, in our cosmic neighborhood. He's a member of several academies, to name a few, American Physical Society, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Royal Society, US National Academy of <laughs> Sciences. He has many awards to his honors, uh, including Gold Medal of Royal Astronomical Society in 2008, Balzin Prize in 2011, Henry, Nori, Henry Norris uh, Russell Lectureship in 2018, Gruber Prize in Cosmology in 2019. He's also an excellent science communicator. He has written several popular science books, to name a few, The Infinite Cosmos, On the Shores of Unknown, and Cosmic Enigmas are some of them. He continues to be an active inspiration to young researcher in cosmology. And if you uh, if you have a chance to interact with him personally, you'll see that his energy and enthusiasm is unmatched. He continues to show us how to dream big, and you'll see glimpses of that in his talk today. So today, Professor Joseph is going to tell us about black holes in the cosmos. Thank you. Can you please sit on your mic? Yes, the mic's on. Okay, so th thank you so much um, for that introduction. And it's a real pleasure to um, be here in, in Mumbai and um, I'll be visiting Bangalore next week. And these will be uh, both, I think, science highlights of my visit. Anyway, so my um, function today is to tell you about black holes, which should be, I'm sure, familiar to um, many in the audience. Um, they're, you know, the most mysterious, the most wonderful objects in the universe, perhaps, and still a great mystery to us, but we have made enormous progress in learning about them. So let me um, begin with um, a quotation from Subramanian Chandrasekhar. The black holes of nature are the most perfect macroscopic objects there are in the universe. The only elements of their construction are our concepts of space and time. So he devoted much of his life to um, admiring and understanding the details of black holes in um, many, many major contributions to science. Um, another quotation um, from uh, another wonderful contributor to gravitation theory, John, John Archibald Wheeler, the black hole is a completely collapsed object. It is mass without matter. The Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland faded away, leaving behind only its grin. A star that collapses to make a black hole fades away. There remains behind only gravitational attraction, the attraction of disembodied mass. Well, these are wonderful quotations, I think, and, and try to... Um, give you some understanding of the awe in which we, we hold black holes and now welcome them as um, a major part of, um, of astronomy today. So um, a little bit of history, the idea of a collapsed object, collapsed star, was first advanced by um, uh, an English German, a geologist actually by background, um, and he estimated uh, the effect of light passing by a black hole, um, which uh, uh, would, his trajectory would be perturbed by the mass of the black hole. So he estimated the deflection effect. Um, uh, this was um, uh, in the 18th century, actually. And things remained where they were, but of course, a prediction without measurement is, is something that um, doesn't necessarily uh, fill us with awe, but what happened next um, was impressive. So here is his very simple calculation. He said that if a star is too compact, light cannot escape, and that there is um, a critical scale 
which we um, now call the Schwarzschild radius, and he estimated the, the curvature of the light rays. However, um, uh, and we have, of course, um, seen later evidence in modern astronomy for, for black holes. But um, in fact, um, he got the number wrong. And so Einstein first repeated his calculation. Um, and, but when he went on five years later to apply general relativity, which he invented, to get the correct answer for the deflection of light by a compact body, he got the, the answer, which was twice um, uh, the simple Newtonian um, version um, uh, and demonstrated that one really did need a new theory of gravity uh, to, and this was a major prediction of that theory. So that was the estimate of the effective deflection of light and the first idea was of course to go to a total eclipse and look for deflection of light from background stars by the sun and uh, this was um, uh, an idea that um, was jumped on immediately by one UK astronomer Arthur Eddington who um, uh, was famous among other things for his work on stars and came up with the idea that um, astrophysically uh, stars simply had to exist just by doing simple arguments about gravity. And so that was one thing he's known for, his work on stars. But at the same time, when he was um, in his early days of research, he decided that he would try to uh, lead expeditions to confirm uh, the deflection of light predicted by Einstein. And um, within um, a year or, or so after the, uh, the prediction of the deflection of light expected, um, he, in fact, he avoided being conscripted into the UK army, who was a, a, a Pacific um, objector, basically. Um, he led an expedition at the, the following year to see a total eclipse, set up telescopes, and measure the direction of light. And amazingly, um, you can see Einstein's prediction, um, 1.74 arc seconds, double that in Newtonian theory. And the measurements were very close to Einstein's value despite the impacts of um, limited visibility due to poor weather at the periodic times during the, the observation. And this confirmation of Einstein's prediction was of course gre greeted in the newspapers with amazing um, uh, publicity. This was a, a front page from um, one of the major newspapers in the UK and that Einstein's theory of triumphs, stars are not where they seem to be and so forth. This was something new, radically new. It was realized immediately. So it's rare, in fact, for a discovery um, in physics or astrophysics or astronomy to receive such immediate attention in the press, actually. But this did, you know, immediately after discovery. Well, let's talk about a little bit of background to this. So um, uh, Einstein's idea was basically that matter, uh, the presence of matter, is and the deflection of light is explained by the fact that space is curved around this compact object. Um, and um, it's the effect of the curvature of space that's responsible for the, for the motion of matter. And all of this was um, uh, beautifully summarized by Wheeler, among others, um, in later years. And so you can see uh, this major prediction, well, let's now more generally look for the effect of light deflections. Um, a, a, around um, other stars, around galaxies, they should be significant, around clusters of galaxies, even more significant. And uh, this prediction um, was then sought for. Um, it took, you know, half a century for the astronomers to really uh, have good enough equipment to look for this, uh, but it, it happened. And here you can see one of the beautiful results, um, this from... Um, uh, a Hubble Space Telescope observation, actually, of the effect of um, lensing on a background galaxy um, uh, by the dark matter and the matter in the, in the galaxy you see here. 
And of course, the light is um, deflected, but it, it deflected if you're in, into a circle, basically. Um, if you're, uh, uh, and you can see this, the spread of this uh, light, direct measurement of, um, of uh, the, the curvature of space. And this effect has been seen now in many galaxies. So we know that it's not just the sun that weakly deflects light, but we have stronger effects coming wherever we have concentrations of matter. And in fact, we've learned about dark matter this way. Uh, Okay, let's see. I have to do something here. All right, can someone? Okay, right, thank you. Okay, so now that's enough. This, these, of course, are small effects, weak gravity effects. Uh, this small deflection of light, in this case, so, somewhat larger than from the sun, but nevertheless, let's think about strong gravity, and that means let's get to black holes. Okay, so let me jump straight in to astrophysical black holes um, and more massive black holes. So by astrophysical, I mean stars, massive stars, um, uh, tens of times the mass of the sun or or the most massive stars are some 200 times the mass of the sun, their fate will be eventually to collapse into a black hole. Uh, and these black holes are routinely observed now indirectly because onto uh, a black hole, um, if it has a star around it shedding mass, the mass concentrates onto the black hole, heats up, emits X-rays. So we see many X-ray sources. Uh, at the same time, we um, have learned, and this was, uh, uh, a surprise uh, that massive galaxies have massive black holes in their centers, even what we call supermassive black holes. Our Milky Way has a four million solar mass black hole, and one that weighs in up billions of masses is at the center of one of the nearby galaxies to us, massive galaxies to us, Messier 87, I'll come to that in a second. But the, so these black holes span the, uh, the mass range that goes up from millions to billions. So we see black holes in the range of tens to hundreds of solar masses now um, as the sources of um, X-rays. This was uh, from many sources in the galaxy. We can inf infer the mass of the companion star, gives us the mass of the black hole. So we know the masses, they're remnants of stars. And we see these supermassive stars, which must be the remnants of many stars merging together um, in the centers of massive galaxies. What happens in between? So theory says there should be continuity in this. Uh, where are the black holes of thousands of solar masses? They should be there. Why do we think they're there? Because if you want to build up a black hole of a million or a billion solar masses, the range we see, you need seed black holes to build that up. And that means thousands of solar masses. So they must be there in space. And the only place that we um, so far have found them, they could be wandering around for all we know, is at the centers of very small, very faint galaxies. These galaxies are very faint, most likely because the black hole has helped shed much of the gas that might have been stars from its intense gravity, from its interactions, which I'll show you in a second. Anyway, we're beginning to discover these now, but it's still a big mystery as to how many there are. So that's an interesting part of parameter space that modern astronomy, modern astronomy is focusing on, intermediate mass black holes. So we know that the, astro the tens of solar mass black holes from stellar collapse, the big ones from uh, weird things at the centers of galaxies involving mergers of many objects together to make a big black hole. The seeds in between we're beginning to discover now. That's the current state of the art in our field. Okay, um, so the major breakthrough came um, four or five years ago um, with gravity wave interferometers. So these are experiments designed to look for black holes when Two black holes merge together, space time gets basically shaken up. You emit gravity waves, as Einstein predicted. And these produce um, a shearing in a very weak shearing in space. And you have uh, in, in this example um, an interferometer, uh, two actually, which have been built. The first ones are built in, in, in the US, in the state of Washington, and in and in the state of Louisiana. And they basically are um, long interferometer beams. And one looks at tiny differences in the reflections, multiple reflections of those beams. Uh, and what you're looking for is the following signal. 
So this shows you um, the sort of signal that we're, we're looking for. Um, uh, as the space um, basically is um, uh, shaken by the passage of gravity waves, this is the amplitude of the waves, um, finally merging together um, and then fading away uh, when the two black holes collide. Now, it, th this is, you know, all seen in fairly distant objects, but here is the if reason that um, you're seeing an effect on this interromer beam. Space basically is sheared um, as a wave passes by the, inter the interferometer beam, and the, therefore the, the, reflect the reflectors of the beam um, are slightly perturbed. You're looking for this tiny effect um, that's an asymmetric, okay? The difference between two perpendicular beams is what is seen, and you see and you can see this, you look for this oscillation. So um, what, what, what is then seen is this was the first signal that was detected independently by the two interferometers. So one was, um, as I said, in, um, on, in, in Washington, one in Louisiana, and they measured the, 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 I showed you before, the simulation, and this is the predicted effect um, of the uh, merging of the two black holes, shaking up space, giving you gravity waves, the final um, chirp, as it's called, of the merger, and the ring down effect at the end. And from this, you can learn from studying this wave form, you get, first of all, um, you can infer directly how far away this thing is from the redshift, basically, of um, redshifting of the emission from the source. Um, we're looking at distances of roughly a uh, tenth or so of the size of the observable universe for most of the events seen so far. Um, and the main interesting thing, though, is that um, the mass of this particular object was something like 30 solar masses. So these are typically what was expected from the end product of massive stars. A star of um, 50 or 100 solar masses will end up leaving you a black hole behind of this sort of mass. Many of these massive stars are in binary systems, so naturally their black holes eventually merge together and give you the signal that we're seeing. So these are the signals and the events that were being discovered. Okay. Um, so now we're at this fascinating stage after several years now of observations, um, beginning around 2019 or so, where we have um, the, the two American experiments, um, uh, LIGO, um, joined by um, a European experiment called Virgo and um, a Japanese experiment, which is about to take first light um, in the next two or three months. And so they've had several years of observational campaigns. And um, uh, right now um, they're, they're gearing up for the next campaign and each, they improve the instruments each time, go deeper into the universe and uh, will be um, exploring larger distances. So here we are roughly, um, you know, a megaparsec, a, a, a fraction of a percent of the observable universe, 10% roughly for the two more powerful ones. But in the future, we'll be going um, to basically uh, distances of order of um, hundreds of megaparsecs, that is 10% of the observable universe or thereabouts. And so these are the black holes we've discovered so far uh, in what we call the stellar graveyard. And first of all, these are the more astrophysical ones discovered from X-ray emission in the nearby universe. Um, and here you see the masses of the black holes. And these are all the gravitational wave events with, with their own so of the two black holes coming together. So there are two, typically two dots and, and the um, two black holes coming to give you a third black hole, give it, this is the event. And so we're, we're seeing black holes of up to, you know, more than a hundred solar masses and all the way down to a few solar masses. So it's a, it's a wonderful discovery over, over several years, black holes which had not been seen directly before are now being detected by the shaking of space as they merge together. So, um, and this will continue and we expect to get uh, many more of these, of, of these um, systems as, uh, in the next observing campaigns. Okay, um, so um, that is um, not all of course, um, uh, we're expecting soon in, well, it'll be 10 years perhaps in India, we'll join in the party with um, the uh, LIGO India gravity wave detector. Uh, and, um, and then on uh, a, a similar timescale, 
uh, there'll be a space version. Now, all depends on the length of the interfer interferometer arms, which determines your sensitivity and the frequency at which you can measure gravity waves. And so LIGO Virgo um, and likewise um, LIGO India and CAGRA will have a few kilometers. Um, but if you want to go to much lower frequencies and watch the spiraling in of the black holes, um, emitting gravity waves as they come in, you have to have much longer baseline. So that will happen again around 2037 or so with a space-borne interferometer, three satellites now forming a triangle um, uh, orbiting the sun and the variations in the length of that triangle, the tiny variations will measure the impact of passing gravity waves. And so that will give you lower frequencies and help you fill in the picture of where these uh, black holes come from that are merging together um, again, mostly sensitive to, to smaller black holes, but LISA will be also sensitive to stars or smaller black holes falling into big black holes at these lower frequencies, right? Because the distances are longer, the light traveling time is longer, therefore the frequencies are lower. So LIGO will take us up to millions of solar masses for the black holes as de possible detections. So that's the exciting future ahead of us. Um, and so what we know and what we're looking forward to exploring more with LISA is the fact that inside massive galaxies like this one, there is a very uh, supermassive black hole in the center that may weigh perhaps hundreds of millions of solar masses. Now, I'll show you direct evidence for this in a second, but this has been a conjecture for a long time because in the centers of uh, many massive galaxies, we measure highly active galactic nuclei, which emit strong emission lines, and that energy is conjectured to come from a central black hole. Okay, so, and, and in the extreme events that happen when that black hole is being fed by increasing gas debris from stars, um, from the interstellar medium, you get quasars, they're extreme events. And we believe that the core of the quasar is a supermassive black hole, giving you that energy from stuff falling in, heating up, and then swirling around and eventually being ejected outwards, as I'll show you in a second. Okay, so that's that's what we think, and but it's, amazingly, we've made progress in this. Okay, so um, first of all, the center of our galaxy. So that's the closest massive black hole, weighs in at some few million solar masses, and um, how we discovered this was by measuring the orbits of stars. This is the central uh, parsec in, the, in, the, in, our, in our Milky Way galaxy seen in the infrared. And so these are orbits of stars going around. And so these orbits close in, some go close into the central black hole, give you the mass of the black hole. Okay, and of course, this wonderful discovery was awarded with the Nobel Prize uh, in the last few years by um, um, Gez and Genzel. And um, here again are those stars that um, have, uh, uh, and this is taken over uh, a period of uh, a few years, and you can actually measure the orbits of these stars. So it's an amazing measure of gravity in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And so that gives us great confidence in the mass of this black hole, four million solar masses, right close to us, just 8,000 parsecs away. Okay. Um, now I mentioned feedback. So the other thing, one of the major implications of black holes for astronomers is that as gas falls in, uh, it swirls around and we strongly believe the gas is magnetized, okay? We know that from many other observations, interstellar medium, interstellar gas is magnetized. Uh, the magnetic field lines wind, wind up, the black hole is also spinning, the gas is spinning from magnetic momentum. And the net result is that you accelerate the stuff and you send out intense, relativistic jets actually powered by reconnection very close to the black hole. So that's a theory, but we observe these jets and the amazing observations like this tell you that something uh, incredible like this is going on. Here's a galaxy and these are radio maps and you see a jet coming out, uh, running through the intergalactic medium and then basically running into a cloud and turning into a, a huge uh, cocoon of relativistic particle emission, radio emission. So this is jets at work. Of course, this is a case where the galaxy was just had stars in. But now imagine a, a young galaxy where the same thing happens. It's a young galaxy is full of gas in the process of making stars. But we'll have a black hole. Remember, the center of a galaxy is dense. So where's the galaxy formed? Probably the center collapsed first. That's where gravity is strongest. So naturally, there you make a black hole. Stuff falls on the black hole. And in this forming galaxy, 
there is output in the form of jets from that from that central black hole. That has the effect of sweeping gas out of the galaxy, giving you what we call feedback, which is a major part of understanding what galaxies are today. If you if you didn't clear them out early on or help, then galaxies, everything would fall in. We'd have much bigger galaxies than we see, actually, if you're a problem. So we strongly believe that black hole feedback is a critical element of forming galaxies as you see in this cartoon. So that's a conjecture. And we have to confirm all of this, of course, by actually um, finding out more about the central black hole. OK, um, and so that was done with another major uh, breakthrough in astronomy called the Event Horizon Telescope, which in reality is a dozen telescopes situated all over the Earth and basically staring at uh, a black hole and using interferometry to basically give you this immense baseline of several thousand or even up to 10,000 kilometers, which can basically give you amazing resolution. And so you can study the light from that central black hole um, at millimeter wavelengths. Um, and what was observed was the shadow of the black hole. You're, lo you're looking at close to the horizon of the black hole. A light cannot escape, leaves you a dark spot behind. That basically defines the size, the Schwarzschild radius, or the Kerr-Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. And so that is what we see. And this structure that you see around it is, is the disk of accretion, the gas that's basically falling in and spinning around the black hole, feeding the black hole, in the case of these active quasars, much more quiescent than our Milky Way case. But nevertheless, it gets distorted by gravity into this, this feature that you see. That's that's the effect of the disk around, and the shadow is a thing in the middle. And so recently, um, there's been an attempt at using um, machine learning to try to uh, redo a much better job. I don't know quite how precise this reconstruction is, but this, in fact, is a, is a reconstructed version of, um, of the shadow of the black hole. Looks beautiful, of course, um, but it's reconstructed anyway around Messier 87, which is the massive galaxy, some 20... Um, uh, Mega parsecs, million parsecs away from us. Okay, um, what's interesting is that because um, uh, M87 is about a hundred times further away than the distance to the center of our galaxy, uh, so when you look close by, you can actually look at a much lower mass black hole, roughly the same resolving power, in fact. And so the same experiment was used to study the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and the results have been published too. And this is the, the, the shadow of Sagittarius A, the center of our galaxy, um, also shadow of the black hole, effect of some accretion disk around it. And the resolution is micro a few micro arc seconds. Quite amazing um, that we now have actual images of black hole shadows, proving beyond any doubt that we have massive black holes to deal with. So um, that is um, where we are now um, with black holes. We've found them, they're X-ray sources. Um, they're uh, seen you know, throughout the galaxy now with gamma ray telescopes. That's the effect of accretion onto a black hole as an indirect observation. Um, we, um, we, we see them by the merging of the black holes as gravity wave bursts. Uh, these are astrophysical black holes. Then on the, on the massive side, we're looking at um, now direct resolution of the images of the massive black holes in so far now at least two cases. Okay, um, so let me now tell you about another aspect to this theory, which is that, fine, I've told you about the formation of black holes. We, we're beginning to understand how they formed uh, by, mer by in massive stars when they die, merging together, that's how we see them. The biggest black holes are the merging of many smaller ones, plus accretion of gas as well. We're not totally sure how the biggest ones form. These intermediate mass ones are the key, and we're beginning to look for those now, maybe even discover a few. But there's another possibility that, um, uh, which has its own angle of interest that astronomers are fascinated by, and that is this, that we, and it begins with the following point, that there is, the universe is full of dark matter, but we have no idea what the dark matter is. We've been looking now for 30 years. We have different experiments, um, absolutely no idea. Nothing has been found um, uh, that really is definitive evidence of dark matter. 
despite many, many theories and continuing numbers of theories which seem to explode exponentially now as the years go by. Not, nothing's been found. But um, these dark matter particles, which we think they are, many people think they are, are highly weak interacting, but we just don't know if they exist or not. Okay. However, black holes are black, they're dark, and they do exist. Now, it is true that the black holes made by stars, they're just a fraction of the mass in the baryons of the universe, they cannot be the dark matter. And these supermassive black holes can't be the dark matter either, because there certainly cannot be so many of them. Otherwise, we know we'd be burnt out by the light from quasars. So the only option, though, is to go to the early universe and say, well, look, black holes, we have gravity, it made the galaxies, it made the stars. Why couldn't it make black holes? And black holes exist. So we suddenly have a candidate for dark matter that exists. Okay, that's the first thing. And secondly, um, how on earth can you persuade the universe to make black holes? Well, that's actually not so difficult because we just need density fluctuations early on. If they're large enough, the matter collapses and bingo, you have a black hole. Now, you don't want to make 10 solar mass black holes. I'll show you why we'd have observed them. You don't want to make million solar mass black holes that accrete so much gas, the universe will be glowing, but you can make smaller black holes, right, early on, because the scales are much smaller in the very early universe. Could that be the dark matter? That's the intriguing question. Okay, so known physics, but what you've got to do, of course, is change the initial conditions of the universe a little bit. You've got to tweak things, so instead of just making galaxies, early on you had really high density fluctuations that could have collapsed to make black holes, or basically the horizon size of the early universe, which is very small if you go back early enough. That's the basic story. Um, and the way this um, sort of happens is this is uh, um, the sort of thing I can calculate in general relativity. You ask, you know, let's, let's, we have lots of density fluctuations in the galaxies, but we don't really know what the density or the tail is, the extreme, the extreme numbers are there, how dense could these fluctuations be? So it's a question of tweaking the tail. Uh, that is physics that, you know, we can basically hypothesize about, but it's known physics, adding some more density fluctuations. But one can easily write down inflation models that can do this if you worry about where they came from. So that doesn't seem to be a real problem. Once you add a fluctuation like this, then, well, um, if it's dense enough, bingo, it collapses out of the universe. And, and suddenly, with this extra power on small scales, you can make early black holes. So that's that's the idea. And um, it turns out not to be you know, entirely crazy. Um, uh, my colleagues have worked out many, many different ways to make this, these early density fluctuations. Uh, so suddenly, you might have um, a phase transition early on, which leads to things being pressure going down to zero, not being basically driven by the speed of light, pressure one third, the energy density of radiation is a normal equation of state, but maybe it's much less for a brief period during a phase transition, then you'll make structures like black holes. That's one, one idea. And it goes on. Um, there, are, there are other ideas using cosmic strings and loops of strings and collisions in the early universe of phase transition bubbles um, and, and and so on, okay, and quark confined models even. Okay, so all of these are options for making extreme fluctuations. Um, and it's fascinating. I'll just show you one example, which is maybe the most plausible of these things, which worries about the equation of state in the early universe. So there was a time as the universe um, cooled down um, from high to low temperatures, when various types of particles condensed out of the Big Bang. And this is how we think um, you made the, the quarks initially, the first quarks, and then protons. You had anti-protons and anti-protons, basically in collision with the thermal Big Bang. But as time goes on, there was a freeze out. Some of these were left behind. And that's where we think the, um, the relic baryons come, come from, if you have some initial asymmetry in your conditions, whatever. That's all of the story. But the point is that you can make matter in the universe through various 
phase transitions, which leave these particles to condense out. And from the mass of the particle, you know, you know, roughly, um, it, this is sort of basic QCD calculation, you know, roughly what, what temperature we're talking about, and electrons, you know, and MEV, so basically that they can fix a certain temperature. Likewise, if you go to the, um, to, to the pi meson, you get a temperature of, you know, corresponding to hundreds of, e, of uh, MEV or whatever. Okay, so this tells you that at certain times, there was a phase transition that led to a momentary, if it was a second order transition, maybe a momentary you know, drop in the equation of state. And that leads to instability ideas. And this is one of the more attractive ones, I think, that says that, well, maybe um, if we apply this argument, let's calculate the mass scales at which all this occurred. And lo and behold, you know, 10 solar mass is sort of a natural um, for the earliest transition. And this is an attempt to use these transitions, um, electron, positron, pion, et cetera, PP bar, to try to calculate the fraction of black holes that might be produced. And you get up to interesting numbers. So this involves a certain amount of uncertainty in how you convert you know, phase transitions, which don't quite all the way there, to giving you a completely cold universe briefly into black holes. But that can happen. And that's the most, I think, physics-connected way of doing this, which uh, could give you a guide. Okay, so now let's turn to observations. So we have all these events out there um, from LIGO and Virgo, and now soon more telescopes entering the game, which tell you something about the frequency of black holes in the universe over different mass ranges. In addition, for the more massive ones, gas can accrete onto them, give you um, X-rays and other distortions early in the universe, these are primordial, which can distort the bright gray background. So we have constraints. And so the sum of all those constraints is, is the following, that if you plot the allowed black hole fraction against the mass now of a primordial black hole, and you put in the various experimental limits, uh, which come from the LIGO-Virgo observations and the Planck observations, this one constrains the uh, the uh, accretion implication, this one constrains the gravity waves, you, you're limited with a roughly um, of order 1% maybe of most of the dark matter could be in primordial black holes of a solar mass, roughly a solar mass. So there's a little bit of evidence now that uh, in the gravity wave observations, because we're measuring, um, we're measuring a gap in the... Um, in the mass distribution that we're finding from LIGO Virgo, uh, it's a peculiar gap. We know that black holes should not be produced below two solar masses, um, or actually below five solar masses. So we're measuring one or two events which seem to be indicate there are black holes of lower mass. So that's the only argument I know of that says maybe there could be some primordial uh, black holes if we don't know how to make them astrophysically of such low mass. But that's a that's a weak argument because there are big error bars. However. Um, the, the bottom line is that 1% is what you're stuck with. But if you want to go to much smaller black holes, then it's really interesting because um, the um, here, here are the limits that we get from looking at um, smaller black holes. So now um, I'm, this combines both current and future limits. So let's focus on the current limits uh, for the moment. But you can go to um, mass ranges. So we're looking at black hole mass ranges, which are, um, um, so these are basically um, uh, solar mass uh, type measurements and show you various limits on the black hole mass fraction. And you can sort of, um, this is very large scales over here. You, you know, there are very few from the microwave background, but as you go down to lower masses, um, you're suddenly allowed um, the possibility of more black holes. So what, what I'm going to do is focus on these gaps in the constraints. Um, just to, um, So this is the slide I really want to show you. We're now, we're looking at, um, uh, and so th these masses are in grams down here. Um, and so what you can see is that this is basically a solar mass over here. So these are upper limits and show you that from the constraints I talked about, we're dealing, you know, with less than 10% of the mass fraction. Okay, and there are other limits from basically accretion arguments that rule out everything else. But you notice there's a gap. So at, down here, you get Hawking evaporation, which destroys the black holes. They evaporate, they're too low in mass, we think. Okay, but in between, there's a really interesting window 
So this is where you get to asteroid masses, asteroid equivalent masses, and this could be the primordial black hole range. Now these be formed in the very early universe, early enough um, where you don't have any direct constraints on the physics. It's too early um, for their um, uh, for them to have any impact at all, our accretion or whatever. And what is intriguing is that if these black holes form very early out of the radiation dominant universe, then all then you don't need to make very many. They're very rare objects initially. The radiation redshifts away, and lo and behold, this tiny fraction early on can dominate the dark matter. Okay, and that we can um, uh, see. At, I'll show you in the next slides. But first question is, if there were such a thing going on, how do you tell the difference? Okay, between a primordial black hole, maybe you can make them recently for all we know. Okay, and maybe you make some solar mass black holes early on, or 10 solar mass black holes, a small fraction, but you'll see them. So there's an amazing difference, really. The astrophysical black holes are made in the recent universe from stars, but early on there were no stars, they're primordial. So if you have a powerful enough gravity wave detector, you can look back into the universe, look for gravity wave bursts, and lo and behold, you'll see a big difference. So this shows you effectively uh, what you can begin to search for. We have you know, the so-called population three, which all the massive stars early on. And as you go back in time, there are fewer and fewer. And this is a primordial contribution. Okay, So if there are any, anything interesting going on at all in these mechanisms for making primordial black holes um, of tens of solar masses or whatever, we should see a lot of them early on. And that we hope to do with the next generation of gravity wave telescopes in the future, which I'll come to in a moment. Okay, so that's part of the story there. And this is then just to um, remind you of the point, uh, point I also made that in the early universe, the radiation dominated everything, but the black red shifts away, okay? But black holes do not red shift away. Their, their numbers just expand away, but the mass is there. And this means that late on, you can suddenly have a, uh, have a, you know, they begin to dominate throughout the radiation era, and you suddenly can, at the late times, have a universe with a lot of primordial black holes, even though very early on, there are very, very few indeed. You could estimate this might be 10 to the minus 20 or something, a tiny fraction of the total energy of the universe, the very early on, could make these asteroid mass black holes. So it's, you need some process that's rare, but it's, it's also known, known physics, really, using tinkering around with, with gravity and initial conditions of the universe. So to me, it's, it's an interesting hypothesis that you know, may turn out to be our best dark matter candidate. OK, which leads you to the next question, which is, what if the black holes are much less than asteroid mass? Well, there's the problem of Hawking evaporation, which says that if the black hole weighs less than about 10 to the 15th grams, OK, um, then it Hawking evaporates and could not be the dark matter. And this gives you this natural window which zeroes in on the asteroid mass. Well, is this correct? Do we believe in Hawking evaporation? So um, presumably there are some string theorists in the audience who are far more expert on this than I am, but I think the bottom line is that we have not detected Hawking radiation, and we have yet to convince ourselves that it really did happen. And so basically the, the, the point is that if the temperature, the effective temperature of the black hole, first um, estimated by Beckenstein and company, um, it depends you know, inversely on the mass, the smaller the black hole, the, 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 the thermal radiation that you get from the black hole um, is hotter and hotter. Um, so obviously you can't, irrelevant for the sun, um, but if you go to very small black holes, um, then in principle, it, it's hot enough so it can evaporate and you can estimate the evaporation time. So irrelevant for the sun, but if I go to 10 to the minus 15 grams, suddenly it's much less than the age of the universe. And bingo, um, they're, they're even exploding today at this mass. So you might see some exploding black holes. And you also might expect you know, complex signals because they would radiate according to their um, you know, effective temperature, which um, when you have the final bit of the black hole radiating could be very high gamma rays, neutrinos, whatever. Also, the signals are postulated. But we've never seen this effect happen. OK, so it's, um, it's possible that some of these very small black holes might resist radiate, radiating because for some reason they're not as hot, okay? And, um, uh, and so this might be a way of testing Hawking radiation. 
Um, so I'm going to show you one um, uh, far out idea, which um, I think is a natural way of making black holes, tiny ones which don't evaporate. So how do you avoid them evaporating? Well, you have to make them very close to being extremal. This might mean spinning very rapidly or being highly charged. These are radical ideas that we have no idea how to really, whether they could occur or not in physics, but there is one way which could occur. It's a natural way with no fine tuning of making a black hole that doesn't radiate. And that is going to higher order gravity. So you say there's some gravity scale up there, which takes you into five dimensional gravity or any N dimensional gravity or whatever. And so the idea is the black holes, when they're large, their Schwarzschild radius, the horizon scale is larger than that scale. They evaporate as um, uh, Hawking et al, Beckinson et al told us. But when they hit this scale, bingo, you stop. Okay, when you get into this higher order gravity black hole, the only option for energy loss is Kaluza Klein type, uh, type oscillations. Type. And so and that you won't see, and that doesn't carry the mass away. So basically, you have a way of producing black holes, which are um, essentially small black holes, which can live for nearly ever or almost ever, depending on how close they get to extremality. So you can express, you can express the extremality parameter by some tiny parameter epsilon, how close you are. And in principle, you can lower the mass range of black holes. And so this is the um, sort of picture that you can come up with. And that is that, um, so this is the fraction of dark matter uh, in these tiny black holes. This is the standard um, uh, line here from when evaporating today. You can set constraints on them from gamma rays in particular, because even the ones that might take 100 Hubble times to evaporate, to evaporate, evaporate very slowly, but they give you some gamma rays. So you can, you can rule out black holes of all, the, all this mass range from various observations, but suddenly you find that now if I make them extreme or close to extreme or close to this limit from higher order gravity, for example, or you could obtain this by high spin equally or high charge, the, there are other routes to this, you suddenly have an option where you can have very small black holes. So that's the, um, and it's this tiny parameter, um, this parameter epsilon which controls this, and it, this just shows you as, you as you lower this deviation from extremal from extremality, um, getting closer and closer, it will get smaller and smaller. You can expand all of this range um, to these uh, possible black holes. Okay. Um, yes. 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 I, I perhaps you need a you need a microphone. I and the string theory is that we have uh, astronomers that take higher dimensions seriously, but just for a moment to be conservative, why couldn't we just have rotating black holes and the non-rotating or slowly rotating ones might Hawking evaporate away, and the near extremal ones will stay around and be our dark yeah. matter? Wouldn't that be more You're, you're completely right. So we've thought, obviously worried a lot about that. In fact, most of our paper is on spinning or charged black holes, rising right, black holes. But the problem is it's so easy if you produce these early to destroy extremality, it just takes one charge or something to, you know, to opposite charge to fall in. So um, Schwinger radiation, whatever, there's too many issues that we don't understand, okay? But I think the only surefire way to do this is with higher dimensions. But that, that's, that was, that, that's sort of our story. Okay, um, but you know, it's, it's an example, but it means we have a, a, new, a, a new area of physics to probe basically. Um, like looking near extremality. Okay, um, so let's now, I'm gonna con conclude and tell you about the future and gravity wave astronomy. So right now we have these amazing ways of um, looking for gravity waves. And so this shows you the frequency range that we can address. And so here is the, um, the region uh, that LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA, LIGO, India, et cetera, are all uh, right discussing, that is basically um, hundreds of, of hertz, okay, and going up to maybe a thousand hertz. We have LISA coming on in 2007, 2037, maybe, which will go to lower frequencies. And then we get to the lowest frequencies of all uh, with the pulsar timing array, um, which again would be relevant for. Um, supermassive black holes merging together because that gives you the longest time scale of all, right? They may. Um, and so 
that's interesting, but there are gaps, you see, and the main gap that we worry about um, is over here where this red circle is, and that is connecting up the, um, the LISO, which is millihertz uh, uh, or less range, um, with um, what we're doing with, uh, with, uh, with LIGO Virgos, and there's a gap there. And so the interesting thing to, to bridge this gap between here, this is this is Lisa, and here, which is like a Virgo, there's a, there's a gap of a hundred, you know, what would a hundred times in frequency. Uh, there's only one place plausibly to do this, and there's be going to the moon. And so on the moon, you have a wonderful seismologically quiet surface. And you can build larger interferometers. You can put seismometers on the moon. And so there are several designs out there for this. And all of these designs for lunar gravity wave observatories will basically fill this gap and allow you to watch the black holes spiraling into the supermassive black holes and building their mass up. So that may be the future on a time scale that is not so different from the LISA time scale. Because right now we are going back to the moon. We're looking for science experiments to put on the moon and putting seismometers on the moon in dark craters is one example, which you know was first done by the Apollo uh, astronauts a long time ago. We know all about seismometers on the moon and that is going to be refined greatly and be one example of possibly new gravity wave detection. So that, that's exciting for the future uh, using the moon. Um, so that is um, close to the end of my story except for the fact that there are now third, ge third generation um, gravity wave interferometers being planned. So currently we're stuck with a four kilometer baseline, but the next generation, again, 20, mid 2030s, um, will be uh, to have 40 kilometer long baselines, deep under underground and cryogenic, okay? Uh, similar in design to LIGO Virgo, but in principle, but much more sensitive. And uh, there are two, uh, projects underway. Um, the, the US one is not completely funded yet, but the European one has got gotten the green light to go ahead. And the European one is called the Einstein Observatory and the American one, the Cosmic Horizon Observatories. And bo both will get us to higher sensitivity. And the beauty of what these will do with an increased sensitivity is they'll open up the universe up to redshift 20. So between 10 and 20, we have no idea what is going on, really. We're beginning to see the first galaxies there with the James Webb telescope. But from the gravity wave point of view, if there's a merger of a few solar mass black holes uh, with another one, we'll see that with the next generation of gravity wave telescopes. So it's a whole new vista ahead of us of gravity wave astronomy. And that will happen in the, um, that's will certainly happen in, in the not so distant future. So, um, that's the end of the story. Thank you. We can take some questions. Let me start with uh, some history. I'd like to start with a bit of history which intrigued me which was on uh, the uh, Eddington uh, expedition. And uh, the numbers which you showed, uh, the uh, West African uh, um, uh, expedition actually had much worse error bars than the Brazilian one. But you know that measurement's always associated with Eddington and not with um, whoever led the, uh, the expedition to Brazil. So I was just curious, uh, did yeah. he actually plan both expeditions? Or did no, no, uh, well, he was involved in the planning, I think, but chosen for one of them. Mm. Of course, the second expedition with the poor results had bad weather, simple as that. So they were just unlucky. And, uh, but they centered on the right answer, apparently. So. Um, may or may not make sense, but uh, you know, when you were talking of primordial black holes being formed, uh, there were large density fluctuations which would need to seed them, right? So, if the matter is interacting with light, would it not also drive large fluctuations in the radiation field and you would see it in some relics of that, or is it somewhere not going to happen? Yeah, the scale is much too small, so that almost certainly couldn't happen for the range I'm talking about for whatever asteroid mass black holes. The horizon was tiny. 
And so it's well below any possible resolution to the CMB. Thanks. This is about pulsar timing arrays. I mean, I really remember that in the square kilometer array time, uh, you know, there will be at least 2000 millisecond pulsars or something like that. So uh, I think the constraint they're talking about on primordial black hole just by transit is of the order of, you know, varying from 10 raised to minus, I don't know, eight to 100 solar mass can be constrained. So that will find essentially kind of sweet spot you are talking about that will put a very strong constraint, isn't it? I, I think that's right. I agree. It's going to, that's going to obviously get better. They haven't released results yet, but that will come soon. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the higher dimensional gravity mechanism for forming uh, extremal black holes? Um, yeah, well, I, I guess it works all the way from um, any dimension in principle. Um, that will give you some specific um, uh, scale, some specific mass scale at which this effect could occur. And so, yeah, um, the, the idea is that when you're away from the compact, from this limit, which um, effectively is comp effectively compactified. Um, it's normal gravity, so you evaporate, whatever. But when you hit the scale, then uh, there's no way uh, to, to have electromagnetic radiation or anything like that when you have a higher dimensional. So it, it, I think it's made, it's only evaporation equivalent. Its temperature goes to zero at that point, according to the, to the simple estimates we made anyway. And then you would be uh, forced into uh, higher, higher order effects, right? If we had a circle, and the black hole becomes smaller than the circle, then I would have thought that it would evaporate in five dimensions rather than four dimensions. I don't see why it's called. Well, the way it evaporates in five dimensions is via, is, it doesn't evaporate, it loses it, 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 it. The only thing that comes out will be um, Kaluza Klein basically modes. That, that's, the, that, that's the difference, as I understand it. So, okay. Assuming you were really to be charged under the Kaluza Klein Is that correct? Um, Otherwise, yeah. if it's charged, yes. then you would have to emit the exact angle. Right, right, right. I think that is... But then you'd have, I mean, it's, it's, you would have to ask why it's so charged under that. It's the same thing as the spinning thing. No, but I guess his point is the spinning black hole would be spinning. I, I think that's right. Look, let me defer you to my collaborator, who is a string theorist, Elias Kritis. So uh, I... I think that's beyond the boundaries of my knowledge to tell you the details of how this works. I see heard uh, gravitational wave uh, frequency range. Uh, I was hearing that there was this uh, here. Uh, I, I was hearing there is this idea of a desigo. Uh, they used to call uh, desigo. This would be a space-based uh, gravitational wave detector. You did not mention it. So, do do you like? Do do you um, do, do you think that the uh, Desico idea would be worse than the Moon idea? Or yeah, I, I think that's another concept for in more than the concept. Even I believe it's uh, there are Chinese projects well underway. In fact, um, to design that, um, yeah, that, that's another way of exactly getting this um, this uh, frequency gap. Uh, this decahertz frequency gap that I mentioned. And so that's an alternative to doing it on the moon. It's just that um, uh, the DeCargo plans will be expensive, and I'm not quite sure how ready the agencies are to do that um, or have the funding for that in combination with their other projects. Whereas um, the moon, it's an obvious thing to do on the moon because of its size, measure, and quietness. So Ideally, both should be done, space and the moon. But it could well be the moon will come first. So, so the moon would be so just a quick question. So, the, the moon, um, you would, you're suggesting that the length, the the arm lengths will be much bigger to probe a different frequency. There is also the um, possibility that the moon and the Earth detectors create a much longer base, and that can help localization. And so absolutely, on. that that would be something too. But right now, the idea of putting seismometers on the moon is, seems simple enough, 
and the uh, you know that with the Artemis program and all this, it, 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 the concept seems to be one of the leading concepts. We're discussing radio astronomy on the moon, low frequency on the far side, and maybe the second thing that um, is leaping not to the top of this, but near the top for things on the moon, besides seismometers and their applications of gravity wave astronomy. I mean, the details have to be still are being worked out, but in principle, I think it's an interesting way. Thanks. Okay, so not exactly related to gravitational wave, but since we're talking about AGN and low mass black holes, so we do see when we see AGN, the activity, the basically the activity of the black hole, the outburst, it kind of persists, the radiation is kind of continuous. But when we study, for example, low mass X-ray binaries, when you see the light curves, you see like significant breaks in like it, uh, it shows variations basically on very small time scale. So like how is this like is there a completely different mechanism acting different uh what you can say accretion mechanism acting in supermassive black hole and low mass black hole because like the the, the variation of jets because like the low mass x-ray binary the the jets turn off turn on like on the human time scale but on but in when we talk about agents we don't don't see that so like is there a different mechanism altogether to it so, I, I mean, I think when you see variations, you worry about clumpiness in the accreting flow, chaos and all that sort of thing. So, you know, that may play different roles depending on the mass of the black hole and larger, small scales. So, at this point, we wave the hands, but those are still sort of considerations one has in mind. Hello. Yeah, so uh, my question is related that uh, window of PBHs which are kind of open even for dark matter is fully uh, PBH. So uh, if you consider, let's say at the galactic center where you can have a huge uh, gas density um, towards the galactic center. And if you consider that uh, the PBHs, which are tiny um, and for them, the accretion rate will be uh, very small. But if you have a huge enough density of gas, then do you think there will be some signatures which will come from that window uh, uh, through the accretion? I think the worry is the accretion is suppressed much more strongly by the mass than by the density. I see. Because it goes to high power. So if you make the mass small, you're, you're likely, whatever you with density, you'll get nothing. Uh, I, I would worry. Yeah. I, I see. And uh, Sorry. Uh, second question is related to the AGN. So do you have some understanding about when the supermassive black hole at the center were born in the universe? Like okay, so that's a whole story in itself. It depends on the merger history of the Milky Way. We know there was a merger some 10 million, some 10 billion years ago, um, a major merger for the Milky Way since then it's been quiescent. And then mu that must have been the starting point, uh, we think, for forming that central black hole by dumping lots of stuff into the center. And, you know, it's speculation. We don't know. That's so, the bottom uh, line. Is there some observational probe which can probe the birth of that? Black well, the history we can probe with the Gaia satellite. We're doing the dynamics now. You know, that's being studied. So, you know, the accretion history, the merger history of the Milky Way, which is a very indirect way of probing the growth of the black hole. That's probably all we have. Thank you. Go back to one of your slides, and this is my ignorance, where you were ruling out uh, primordial black holes, perhaps uh, in, in the right window. You had one constraint coming from new grab, I guess, was the experiment. N nanograph, right? Uh, yes. And I'm sorry, I just don't know that experiment. Can you just say a few words about it? So this it's, is the experiment that uses pulsar timing. Okay. Okay, so basically, um, you look at the um, the... Basically, as the gravity waves pass by a very long wavelength, the distance to the, to the pulsar changes very, very slightly, and that gives you, a, a, you know, a transient equivalent of an oscillation in the timing signals for the pulsars, which you can use to reconstruct the gravity wave background, the chaotic background, at a, at a certain uh, frequency, low, very low frequency impact. The inverse frequency of 100 light years, basically. So these are really low frequencies. Thank you. 